Here we go. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started tonight. Um, thanks everybody once again for being here. This is the, uh, I believe it's the fourth installment. No, I think it's the third installment of the Trauma Nursing Journal Club. So I'm glad you all were able to uh, find some time to, uh, you know, log in and, and be part of tonight's, uh, hopefully a vibrant conversation. Um, I already mentioned the fact that I'm going to go ahead and record this, post this up on the YouTube channel, and I'll send the link out to everybody. That way, if you have found the article or the article, the, uh, the, the session tonight beneficial, you'll have the link uh, to be able to send it out to any of your, uh, your brother and sister nurses that might be interested or administration or whoever. Um, and, um, you know, maybe we can build a little bit of a, of a gathering for, for the, um, the next installment of uh, Trauma Nursing Journal Club. Uh, for the, I think everybody does know me. I think everybody who's on this call I either work with or I've certainly known over the years or you've participated in other uh, sessions that I've done. Um, I'm Steve Wyman. I'm with the trauma program at St. Joseph's University Medical Center in Patterson, New Jersey. I have nothing to disclose. And um, I'm not certain, I'm not doing this particular series or anything um, as, as an employee of St. Joe's. So the comments and views that I express tonight are strictly those of myself and they do not reflect my employer agencies or other organizations that I, that let me uh, call them, um, call me a member. So um, all of these are my thoughts only. Uh, the topics in trauma nursing and tra trauma nursing journal club are part of a little, uh, little um, uh, group setting that I started earlier in 2022 called the trauma nursing education series. What I try to do is about every quarter do a topic um, of interest um, as, as a lecture, which I do have one coming up, and, and I'll certainly advertise that uh, a little bit later here. Um, and then also we do the Trauma Nursing Journal Club, where I try to take a, an article that I come across, usually from one of the, the, the nursing journals, be it Journal of Emergency Nursing, Journal of Trauma Nursing, um, or one of the other one of the other journals uh, that that nurses publish in, and and, and put it out there that uh, you know particularly for articles that are of particular interest to those of us that are emergency nurses that work in a trauma setting or even a non trauma setting but have a tr interest in trauma care. Um, so you know again thanks for everybody for being here tonight. I hope you find uh, the content tonight um, you know meeting meeting your needs and expectations. Oh, there's my advertisement. So if you're interested, the next topic in trauma nursing is just a scant, I believe, three weeks away. Um, actually, I think exactly three weeks away, uh, December 21st. We're going to be doing a session called the Trauma Diamond of Death. Everybody's familiar with the Trauma Triad of Death. But uh, uh, when I was in um, at Denver at uh, ENA Scientific Assembly this year, I ran into Jessica Mills, and she was actually giving the very last session on the very last day before the uh, before the closing uh, menage that goes on at ENA, and she did a phenomenal 30-minute presentation on uh, calcium and its uh, integration now into the lethal triad and creating what uh, many are now calling the, the lethal diamond. So she has agreed to uh, resurrect her presentation, and will be doing it for us on December 21st. Uh, Jess is down at Newberry County Memorial Hospital in South Carolina, so I'm absolutely thrilled that uh, she will um, be joining us. Uh, those of you that are on the call tonight, I'll send you um, a flyer if I haven't already sent one out to you that has this link on it. You can feel free to register for it. And if we can get a nice grouping together of uh, Jersey trauma nurses, emergency nurses together to listen to her, that would be phenomenal. All right, so here are the goals slash rules of Journal Club, much like Fight Club. Um, basically, what happens in Journal Club doesn't necessarily have to stay in Journal Club. In fact, we hope quite honestly that you find the information in the articles that we present interesting enough to take back to your departments and pass out to your colleagues up and down the line and maybe even implement some best practices that may come out of some of these research articles or some of these uh, best practice articles like tonight's article is. I uh, really want to just review the current literature as it pertains to the practice of trauma nursing. Um, I want to um, hopefully develop a bit of an evidence-based evidence trauma nursing practice model within New Jersey. 
Um, we have got, you know, 10 trauma centers and we've got some very vibrant trauma centers that are doing some really cool things out there. We've got some phenomenal uh, nurses uh, in various positions in our trauma programs. And, you know, that along with our clinical nurses, I'm hoping that we can kind of evolve something and, uh, you know, maybe maybe make a go at uh, doing something that's special for New Jersey. So, uh, again, thanks for being here for that. Um, ideally, we look at um, the first couple of papers we did were research oriented and they tend to scare people away. So I really wanted to pick a paper tonight that was more a best practice, kind of a clinical based type of an article, a modeling article, which tonight's was. And I think it works very nicely. Um, obviously, uh, looking at either best practice implementation or different uh, methodologies that we can replicate within our own departments to maybe, again, bring a change about to the practice of emergency and or trauma nursing. And it really gives us a chance uh, of like-minded, uh, professionals to come together, socialize a little bit, chat, and, and ultimately learn some stuff. And that's what I, kind of my mantra in life is just learn stuff. If you can learn stuff, then, you know, you walk away from tonight, you know, a little bit smarter than when we started, then uh, the goal of Journal Club has been reached. All right, so without further ado, we'll get into it. Um, what I typically do with these is I just kind of go through, I got about 10 or 15 slides here where I'll go through kind of my eyes view of the article and kind of give a summary um, of my interpretation of the article. Um, at any point in time, if anybody wants to jump in with a comment or, or not, please feel free to do so. Um, there will be ample time at the end that I'll open it, open it up. You guys can put on your cameras, we can come together and we can chat about you know anything that's tangential to the article. Um, I would be very interested in 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 listening to you know we've got uh, we've got St. Joe's here we've got uh, Robert Wood Johnson New Brunswick we've got Hackensack uh, Mothership on board Hannah where are you out of I am at Robert Wood Johnson. Oh, okay, very good. So we're doubled up on Robert Wood Johnson, and like I said, we're we're tripled up here with uh, with. Um, with um, Patterson, and then we've got Billy, who's also at the mothership in the emergency department at Hackensack in uh, in Hackensack. So again, I think we've got uh, enough of bandwidth here that we can talk about what our particular environments are. We've got suburban slash urban environments, and then certainly Patterson, we're we're definitely an urban environment. So we'll chat a little bit. All right, so the, the, the title of this article is Patient Extrication Process for Urban Emergency Departments. It caught my eye when it came through um, the journal submission process late last year. I took a look at it and thought that these guys really had done some neat stuff. Um, it's done uh, by um, Jim Glatt, who's out of uh, UPenn um, Presbyterian in Philadelphia. Um, if you're familiar with any of the literature that's come out of UPenn, they are pretty infamous for um, private vehicle slash police drop-offs in their emergency department and uh, publishing some really decent literature on uh, the efficacy of uh, coming of, of individuals coming uh, private vehicle versus ambulance and looking at trauma outcomes, um, particularly with penetrating trauma. So the, um, the, the group that's there as a whole is pretty well known. And, uh, you know, Jim in particular, um, good guy and put together, I think, a very, very nice article with his uh, with his constituents here tonight. So quick shout out to the Journal of Emergency Nursing where this uh, article came from. Um, I am a the trauma the trauma uh, section editor for the journal, so I'm always on the prowl for anyone who wants to write an interesting article, a best practice article, a pearl or a pearl of wisdom article or something like that. So if you've got a case that you've seen that's trauma related, or you've got a best practice that you've implemented at your institution that's trauma related, uh, you know, reach out to me. I'd like to talk with you a little bit and maybe we can uh, you know, uh, motivate you a little bit to actually write an article and then we'll publish it in the Journal of Emergency Nursing. Um, this particular article did garner some local um, head of steam after it was published uh, back in May of this year. Um, in particular, the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer did a very nice article um, about this particular article and, and the implications that it was having within, um, you know, the, the, the emergency departments in the Philly area. Um, and if you're not overly familiar with what goes on in Philly, particularly inner city Philly, with penetrating trauma, uh, the article does a good job of going in initially and just kind of talking a little bit um, about what's been happening there and then ultimately what led up to their developing, you will, this, this best practice protocol. 
Um, they really wanted to create and implement a safe and effective role-based process that they could use to rapidly and safely extricate trauma victims that are being transported to their emergency department. They are an inner city level one trauma center. I said, they're not, in, I don't think they're in center city, Philly. I think they're a little bit on the Southern edge of, of center city, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, they um, get a, a, a large number of patients that are brought into them, just like all of the trauma centers around the Philadelphia area, where uh, law enforcement actually will bring uh, penetrating trauma into them. And this is something that the police department in the city of Philadelphia has done since 1996. There's actually a department directive that was put into place in 1996. And it really allows for uh, officers on scene, when they come on scene of uh, particularly penetrating trauma, to judge whether or not they believe the injury is serious and then put them in the back of a patrol car or a paddy wagon and then take them to the closest uh, trauma center. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the group at uh, P Penn Medicine Presbyterian has published a lot of really good articles looking at the efficacy um, and survivability of these patients coming in private vehicle versus those that are coming in via ambulance. And pretty universally at this particular institution, as well as other institutions that have also published uh, POV or private vehicle versus uh, EMS arrival of trauma patients. It's pretty pretty universally been a uh, survivability uh, 30 days post, uh, post injury has been improved over those that come in by private vehicle versus those that come in by EMS. Um, I think all of us on this call tonight know the the veracity of which, you know, the quicker you get a injured patient to a trauma center, um, the better off they're going to be because, you know, we can mitigate their injuries much more quickly, particularly where you've got hemorrhage as being a primary cause of death in, in this particular uh, environment, um, then absolutely, you know, time is absolute uh, blood saved. Um, and certainly they recognize that back, you know, in the, in the mid 90s in Philadelphia. And, um, you know, but up until very recently, um, the folks at Penn Presby really didn't have a protocol in place by which they would go out and do extrication of these victims out of the back of not only the police cars, but also other private vehicles that were bringing their trauma patient, bringing trauma patients to them. So, you know, they did a quick review of the literature and they didn't find really any best practices that were out there really that, you know, were going to aid them in being able to kind of come up with something without having to invent it themselves. So what they noticed is that um, um, patients that were arriving by private vehicle, particularly the police cars, were arriving in various positions upon arrival, particularly those that were being thrown in the back of a police car, be it a, a sedan or be it an SUV. They typically were finding themselves on the, the, the patients on the floor by the time they got to the trauma center, just because they were thrown in the back, they're not seat belted in, they're laid across the back seat sometimes, and they tend to find where gravity is going to take them after breaking and right and left turns and on their way to the hospital. So, you know, they, they were like, you know, they were coming in, in all these precarious situations and, and we really didn't have, they really didn't have a good way of, of identifying how to best approach these patients and ultimately quickly assess them and then get them out and then get them in for treatment. So, you know, they, they, they developed a, a bit of a multidisciplinary group, both clinic, clinicians and police sat down and they wanted to look at a very systematic role-based approach uh, for how they needed to extricate persons from private vehicles in general, but certainly with an eye on police vehicles since that was the largest number of drive-ups that they were experiencing at this point in time. And, and their goal, which was a logical one, was to create a process to eliminate confusion and improve safety, obviously number one, and efficacy of getting these injured patients out of the vehicle and then effectively getting them into a treatment area. Um, we all know from our own practices, there's been an increase in violence over the last five years, and gun violence is at an all-time high. It hit that all-time high with COVID, and it hasn't come down very quickly in, in the year or year and a half since uh, the peak of COVID. Um, we know gunshot wounds now, unfortunately, are the number one cause of death in the pediatric population, which is sad enough. Um, but we also know more and more victims of gunshot wound violence are coming to the emergency department. And many of those, and in some cases, most of those, are, are no notice uh, arrivals. They're not coming by ambulance, but they're coming by private vehicles. Um, the staff at Penn Presby noted a threefold increase in the number of trauma patients that were arriving by private vehicle between 2018 and 2020. And um, I asked our uh, trauma registrars to pull some data from me here in Patterson, and, and we had some similar results. 
Um, as of um, basically June 29th, which was the uh, the data that uh, Shiloh was uh, kind enough to pull from me from our trauma registry, 54% of our penetrating trauma patients are arriving by private vehicle here in Patterson. That is actually up from low 40s um, just two years ago. So that is, you know, about a 20% increase for us in the number of penetrating trauma patients that are arriving private vehicle. And they're not arriving police car, they're arriving in literally private vehicles. Um, and we still looked at about 7% of our serious blunt trauma is arriving by private vehicle too. So for our particular institution, we certainly are in the same, uh, you know, uh, ba band or the wagon with, with Penn Presby in that, yeah, a lot of our patients are coming in and we certainly did not have and do not have a, a methodology by which to go out and safely, he safely extricate these individuals out of the backs of these cars. So um, certainly this is an article that we at, uh, at St. Joe's are looking at with, with eyes wide open as well. So what are some of the issues with these patients arriving by private vehicle? I think we can probably think of those right off the bat. They're coming in with unknown medical problems. We don't know how badly injured they are because we don't have the purview of EMS uh, colleagues out there being at least able to give us a very quick, you know, 15, 20 second phone call or radio shot as to what they're coming in with, okay? We don't know what the severity of these injuries are. We know they're injured, but they could be anywhere from very minor injuries to very grave injuries. And we see a lot of egregious injuries that are coming in by PV in Patterson. And I'm sure you all are seeing them in your departments as well. It's a no notice arrival. So it's really the squeal of the wheels on the pavement. It's the opening of the door. In some particular cases, it's the thud of the victim slash patient hitting the ground and then the squeal of the wheels running away that really notifies us sometimes that we've got a, a drive up trauma, so to speak. Um, and it's been given another name, but we'll talk about that shortly. Um, there are some legitimate safety concerns. I mean, these are penetrating trauma. They're victims of violence. So there have to be, and there should be, and there must be safety concerns for our staff that sometimes we're not really thinking of. Because again, we're individuals that work in a fairly controlled environment. Yes, it's chaotic a lot of the times, but it is at least somewhat controlled and it's somewhat safe. Um, when we walk outside the confines of our triage area, our ambulance bay, we're no longer in that safe cocoon. And we sometimes don't think about that. And even I myself have found myself early in my career, not always thinking about how important it is to think about safety and safety of yourself as you walk outside the doors to help someone out of a car, or particularly a, a help a, a victim of violence out of, out of a private vehicle. Um, this came up in their article, and it's of course it's always there. These, these patients don't have spinal stabilization done either. What are the implications of that? And, and the real the realization there is it's 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 in penetrating trauma. It, it's probably not needed. Now that's not to say, depending on who was driving the police SUV, that maybe there wasn't some damage caused to the noggin or the neck. But generally speaking, and 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 they did a very good job of looking at a at a at a, uh, a cohort study that they actually did a meta analysis of that really looked at is there really a need to, to worry about you know C spine stabilization in penetrating trauma and pretty universally the the literature at this point in time as well as the outcome of their uh, cohort little uh, study that they put together really showed nah it's really not a worry there. You know, you tend to find unless they're shot in the neck, and even if they're shot in the neck, sometimes and most of the time the bullet goes out of its way not to necessarily hit the vertebral column or the spinal cord. But as a general rule, they found, and, and I've certainly found anecdotally uh, in, in, in my practice over the years that I've gone out and, and, and pulled patients out of these cars, is that not too terribly worried about spinal injuries with them. It's, it's, it's really non sequitur in this particular patient population. And then ultimately, how do we get the patient out of the vehicle? They're laying there crumpled up in the bottom of the floor. We're a bunch of emergency slash trauma nurses. We're not medics. We're not EMTs, or at least most of us aren't. So we don't really have the requisite skills and or competence base to actually be able to very safely and efficiently remove these individuals from the car and do so safely, not only for the patient, but for ourselves as well. And that certainly was the quandary that Penn Presbyterian was looking at with this increasing number of patients that were coming by private vehicle and by police vehicle. 
Now, again, I mentioned this earlier and I'll mention it again. The literature is chock ripe with all kinds of articles about uh, individuals that are brought, traumatized individuals that are brought to the hospital uh, via private means and the survivability therein. And unequivocally, these articles that trace themselves back to the late 1990s um, really ultimately say that uh, those individuals that come by either private vehicle Police vehicle, as the case may be, as we've seen the articles published uh, by Penn Presby and also articles and guidelines that have come out now by the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma, as well as the Western Trauma Association, they've all really kind of come up and said time and time again that guess what? Patients are getting to the hospital quicker as a result of coming private vehicle and or police vehicle, and their survivability is certainly improved tangentially over those that are coming via EMS just because of the, the delays that are inherent in getting an ambulance, an ambulance on scene, and then ultimately getting them to the hospital. This is a good picture of the Penn, uh, Penn Presby uh, drive up area where they actually have their police drop off area clearly marked. Um, this goes, it comes back, this comes from an article that was published about two years ago by the Penn Presby group when they first started looking at some, some really decent data as it pertains to uh, these drive ups. And then if you've been around long enough, and certainly I've been around long enough that back when I was uh, biting my teeth originally back in Kansas City in the late 80s, we in Kansas City came up simultaneously and coined the term homeboy ambulance. And really the homeboy ambulance came from a tremendous amount of gang violence that was going on, not only in Kansas City, but simultaneously was going on in Los Angeles at the same time. So um, in, in my emergency department at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Truman Medical Center, a level one trauma, urban trauma center, um, seeing a large number of penetrating trauma patients at that time in Kansas City, as well as LA County, USC in Los Angeles, started finding that the gang members were, when somebody was shot at, you know, was being shot out in the streets, they were throwing them in the back of the cars and they were bringing them to the emergency departments and they had coined the term homeboy ambulance. And, you know, there was actually studies that were done, a homeboy ambulance study, once again, showing that, and this was some of the earliest studies that are out there showing that these individuals that when they are, when, when they were brought in versus those that were involved in gang violence and shootings that were coming in by ambulance, their survivability was a little bit better for those that were coming in by homeboy ambulance. Um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting because the folks at um, L.A. County actually took this one step further. I'm going to play a little clip here from a show that's one of my favorite um, emergency shows called Code Black. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Code Black. It was a it was a, a television series that ran a couple of seasons. I think it was on CBS and it was canceled, unfortunately, but probably one of the best emergency department related shows that I've ever seen. The thing that's interesting about this is that this uh, Code Black is actually a, a movie out there. It was a documentary called Code Black that was actually done by an emergency medicine resident at LA County. I want to say it was probably back in the mid 1990s. Um, and this resident actually ended up at uh, New York Presbyterian Cornell, where I was working in the city for a while, about the time that the Code Black documentary came out. Um, so it really chronicles him as a resident and some of the things he was seeing um, in the inner city department there in LA, in LA County. But the show in particular, um, when I saw this particular segment, it kind of struck me as being interesting. If he's mama, who's daddy? Somebody's at the door. Oh, boy, drop Let's move. That's Daddy. Got some blood, Tommy. What the hell's a homeboy drop-off? Gangbangers leave their wounded on the sidewalk. Nothing put up a doorbell. Homeboy drop-off. It's all racist. Oh, they gave it that name, not us. Oh, my God. What the hell? You put the camera. Come on. Oh, my God. I have you to hit her up. Come on. Back, Cynthia. Got shot wound to the neck. Literator carotid. He's lost half his volume here. Jesse, gotta get him out of here. Just get the gurney on the knees. All right, you. Get over there on the other side and push with both legs. One, two. Now, I'm not exactly sure that's necessarily a process that was processized as well as the guys did in Philadelphia. 
But uh, at, at LA, at the at the old LA County Hospital before they moved to the new one, they actually had a button and they had a buzzer that went off in their emergency department for the homeboy drop off. And and anytime there was the homeboy drop off, there was a button that uh, was hit out in near the ambulance bay, and it sent off a beacon and a buzzer in their emergency department, letting them know that they've got this homeboy drop off. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But um, at any rate, um, we we do see these, and and that you know obviously drama, you know the the, the drama that's there is that far off some of the things that we do tend to see that, that do pull up in our emergency departments. So kind of back to our article here, um, I, I think that the, the folks um, um, did a really nice job. They, 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 they went out and they looked for a, a tool that they could use to develop, if you will, a, a process that was a validated tool. And they went and they came up with this um, template for intervention, description, and replication, or the, the TIDIR, as it's called. And this is a Cochrane, um, a Cochrane, um, sanctioned uh, tool that's used a lot in, in, in research. It's, it involves a, let me see if we can go for it. It's, it involves a 12 item checklist that really goes through and runs through um, and provides a, a matter of organization and, and, and some quasi validity to, to the processes as you're putting them together, either for to design, to, to design a research project, or in this particular case, a, a, best, pra a best practice project. So the, uh, the folks, uh, when they were putting this together, they came up with their own list of 12 points that I'm sure you uh, took a look at and read in the article. And you know they really kind of used this as the fodder for how to develop their process, fine tune their process, and then ultimately make their process come to reality. So their processes really, I think, were probably six major components there. And we'll talk about each of these components individually. First one is the visual cues for the drop-off, okay? They wanted to make it to where, look, people are going to be coming and they're going to be driving private vehicles and police are going to be bringing and dropping off these trauma patients. We, we should probably make it easy for them to know where to drop them off. So um, particularly for the police uh, side of things, they've got this very clearly demarcated area. Law enforcement is trained. This is the area you go, and this is where you do your patient drop off. Um, it's in their ambulance bay at, at Penn Presby. So I don't really know how this works for other private vehicles that are coming in. I don't know what the proximity is for the walk-in entrance versus the ambulance entrance for this particular facility. I know that from my own facility in Patterson, we've got our walk-in entrance, which is around the corner and kind of, if you will, up a bit up away from our ambulance entrance. Um, so there's a, a bit of a disparity in that people are not coming in and being dropped off at a quasi walk-in slash ambulance entrance area. It's definitely an area that's really a, a walk-in triage entrance. And there's multiple doors in our particular facility depending if you're going to the adult emergency department or the pediatric emergency department. So obviously those are things that we're going to be processing out as we look at this uh, best practice at our facility is that what is it that we can do, particularly to make, uh, the, make it known that if you're bringing a patient in and you need help, this is kind of where you need to go. This is where you need to park your car and security will be there to help you out. You need to have PPE available. We don't think about that, but you know, you're going out to get someone out of a car that has been injured. You don't know what you're going to get yourself into. You need to approach it with PPE just as you would a trauma resuscitation. Um, and that's what the folks at, at Penn Medicine did is they set up an area where um, everybody going out gets fully decoupaged up in all of the appropriate PPE that you'd see them wearing in the trauma resuscitation bay, which, which, which makes sense. Logistically, takes a little bit of time to put it on. Got it. Um, but they've seemed to have have the work around that, you know, it's it's a safety issue over everything else. They then went into role identification. They said minimally they needed two staff members to be available to do this, optimally three staff. Um, and they went and they picked the selected staff that were most proximal to their designated drop-off area. And again, that's something that makes a lot of sense that if you're going to have a drop-off area in maybe your walk-in triage area, what is the staff that is most proximal to that area and how can you best utilize them? Um, and they use a three team member approach where there's a, the team members are identified as team member one, team member two, and team member three. Team member one is responsible for going out and kind of taking the lead on everything. Um, does initial primary assessment and then guides the overall explication process. This is usually relegated to a nurse. Um, then the other two team members really are coming in and they're just really kind of helper bees. They're coming in with the stretcher, with a backboard pre-designated, and then they're using these tools to best extricate the patient. 
one member, in this particular case, team member three stays at the head of the stretcher, locks it down, and then kind of holds it to make sure that the stretcher doesn't move as they're doing part of the extrication process, while team member two is then responsible for utilizing the backboard and then assisting and moving the victim out of the back of the ambulance through whatever means they need to, and getting them either onto the backboard if they're using one methodology, or getting the patient to the ground where they put them on a backboard using another methodology, which we'll talk about in a second. They use, at least in this particular uh, article, they talk about two different scenarios. They did the bridge technique, which was really using the backboard as nothing more than a bridge to go from the back seat of the car to put the patient on and then slide them over onto the stretcher, contrasted with what they call the ground technique, where the patient maybe is in a position where they can't get them up onto the seat. Maybe they're laying on the floorboard of the car. They need to pull them out, put them to the ground, where they put them on the backboard, and then they use the backboard to just lift them up and put them on the stretcher. Backboard is used as nothing more than just an extrication device, much like we use backboards now in the pre-hospital setting, is nothing more than to get a patient out of a vehicle, and then we don't necessarily use it unless we think it's critically necessary on the stretcher itself. At this point in time, they do a hard stop and the patient is patted down by security uh, for weapons. Um, in this particular case, they always have a security officer that's assigned to go out with their team. And in addition to that, they're dealing a lot with law enforcement, bringing patients in as well. So they've got law enforcement there as well. One of the things that I found in my practice over the years is don't rely on law enforcement for having done an effective pat down. Yes, it's part of the vernacular. Yes, they should be competent in it. Yes, every patient that they put their hands on, um, let alone put in the back of a patrol car, should be patted down to make sure they don't have any knives, guns, hand grenade, booby traps, or anything like that on them. But in the adrenaline of the moment, that doesn't always happen. And in, fa in fact, unfortunately, sometimes more times than not, it doesn't happen. So we need to make sure before we bring that particular individual and do anything more with them than extricate them from the vehicle that they are not carrying any weapons, all right? Because let me tell you, any of us that have been doing this long enough have probably come across the scene where there's been a weapon on board. And this is one of my absolute favorite extras. I actually have a hard copy of this x-ray that's actually up on the wall behind me. Um, I call this, when is a bad pelvis x-ray a good pelvis x-ray? And obviously, when you see this in the pelvis x-ray. So this is an individual that was actually brought into us by EMS. And this is a, a many, many years ago. Um, but the patient came in after uh, jumping out of the second floor window of a crack house during a law enforcement raid of the crack house. He jumped out of the window, landed on the ground, uh, busted up his ankles pretty well. And he actually ended up having a, an open tib fib fracture. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do once we got him in was go ahead and get a pelvis film on him. We noticed the person was restrained down. He had an altered mental status, was, was restrained down with soft restraints, but he kept fidgeting around his right thigh. And nobody really understood why other than he's just fidgeting. He's probably high on something. And then the x-ray technician brought this film in and said, uh, guys, you need to take a look at this. And that became a assembling point for all of us that, yeah, you know, don't ever underestimate what is not happening on the part of either law enforcement on the scene. And certainly EMS is not overly adept to be patting people down, nor should they have to. So once again, these things do happen. And we want to make sure from a safety standpoint that we always, always, always make sure that we are keeping ourselves safe above all else. So the implementation of this hard stop is absolutely mandatory. Um, it does create a delay in getting the patient, the victim from the back of the uh, the vehicle into the resuscitation bay, but is an, it's an absolute needed uh, span of time. And it's not something that has to take a long period of time either. You can absolutely do pat down in about four or five seconds and, and do it with a, a high degree of, um, of satisfaction of getting and making sure there's no weapons on these individuals. The other thing obviously they encountered was staff training and what they needed to do. They identified very quickly that simulation-based training was going to be best for them. So they put together a package that included a little bit of didactic information, but then a lot of sim-based training in order to be repetitive and get people into a pattern of doing things. Um, they identified champions who would oversee the simulation process, and they would work with the leadership staff of the department to make it happen. Uh, in this particular case, a lot of their champions were nurses that also had some level of pre-hospital experience as well, um, so that they were ripe for the chore. And they wanted to make sure they included uh, the process when it was done in orientation for all of their new staff, and then also not only their nurses, but all their technicians, their physicians, and security as well. So everybody's operating on the same, you know, same page of music when it comes to how they need to do uh, this particular process. 
And then they put in a plan in place for ongoing drills and training, annual competency reviews. And then every time they do an extrication, which they do fairly frequently, they try to do some kind of a quick debrief after the resuscitation is over regarding the extrication to make sure that there's nothing in the process they need to treat. So there's some level of a continuous quality improvement for process that's built into this process in general. So what were their outcomes? Their outcomes were interesting. Uh, prior to implementing this process, it took an average of just a little over a minute to extricate a victim out of the back of a private vehicle. After the training, they had shaved about 10 seconds off their time. Um, and you know what, you wouldn't think that that's a lot of time, but that's, that's 10 seconds. And 10 seconds in trauma care can be, you know, the difference between life and death can be the difference in perfusion and no perfusion. So getting, you know, that amount of time off and, you know, 10 seconds off that, you know, you're talking tandem amount, about a 20% decrease in the overall time is pretty decent. They also now were much better organized in their approach to getting these patients out of the vehicles. And they also had this safety check procedure of patting the patient down prior to them coming into the emergency department, which proved to be safe as well. Um, it's kind of interesting because I have a good buddy of mine who worked in an emergency department once where, once again, they brought an individual out of a private vehicle that was a gunshot wound to the chest, put him on the trauma bay, and as they were cutting his clothes off, a pistol fell out of his pocket, hit the ground, and put a round into the ceiling of the trauma room. So again, these are very sobering things that, again, manifest the fact that having something that makes sure that there's some kind of a, a pause and, and a safety uh, pause in there is extremely important. And obviously, it, it provided better, better overall organization, and it made it a much safer procedure for all involved, both from the standpoint of mechanics and getting the patients out, and then ultimately making sure that they are safe uh, from the patient uh, of anything they may have on them as they come in. And the final process is published in this article. It's a pretty straightforward flow sheet. What they have done is they took and they separated it because they were getting, um, obviously, individuals that were coming in by private vehicle. Also, they were coming in by police vehicle that were either police sedan, patrol cars, and or police SUVs, but also a lot of vans, a lot of paddy wagons uh, will transport these patients to them through the police as well. So they had a little bit of a different approach, which was using simply a bridging approach um, that they were using for police vans that were bringing these patients in. Um, but again, they go through it, it's protocolized, it's part of the orientation process, it's part of the ongoing competency training for their staff, and again, they are continuously looking at this and improving it almost every time they do one of these extrications at their facility. And then they developed some implications for practice, which I think were pretty salient. Um, they really felt that this model could certainly be used um, and or adapted by other departments that are looking to implement a very similar process, depending on how the layout is and with some minor tweaking without having to reinvent the, the wheel. Um, Certainly they realized that not having that EMS knowledge, that forethought, that pre-hospital notification when it happens, certainly you know, is, is a bit of a downer, but again, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, certainly they say that if you're, if you're looking to, to set up and, and plan one of these, make sure that you've got interdisciplinary support. So not only do you wanna look at your own clinical staff and the security staff at your hospital, but get law enforcement involved as well. Um, more and more police departments are transporting injured patients to the emergency departments. They're doing them more and more with active shooter mass shooting incidents. Um, and the number of police departments today that are actually by protocol transporting patients is tenfold higher than it was five years ago. And it'll probably be 20 fold higher moving forward as this becomes more of a recognized and not a libelous um, methodology of getting victims to the hospital and not waiting for ambulances particularly in the, in the light of an EMS crisis where we are seeing pretty long, long delays sometimes in getting ambulances on scene at these incidents. Uh, this mandatory hard stop uh, needs to be adhered to. Um, it's absolutely important that the minute the patient is extricated from the vehicle, you make sure that, uh, that all safety procedures are in place, that there's a pat down that's done and nothing should go forward without this pat done being, being completed. And then obviously continually follow up continually modify the process. It's a living, breathing, dynamic process um, that needs to, again, be integrated into orientation and ongoing staff training. And I think all of us would probably agree that that makes perfectly good sense. So that is kind of a 
well over 30 minute review of the article from my perspective. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what all of you thought of the article in and of yourselves. And particularly, is there anything right now in your facilities looking at Robert Wood Johnson, Hackensack, that you're doing when it comes to extricating these uh, drive up individuals from vehicles? Or is this, you know, like, wow, now that we've seen this protocol, this might be something we look to uh, protocolize or at least try to do something at our own institutions? I mean, I'll start. I mean, Steve, you and I have talked about this a while ago, back when I was at St. Joe's. I think it's awesome. Um, I never got the chance to try it at St. Joe's. Um, I don't envision myself having a lot of opportunity to try it at Hackensack. Their trauma is uh, not quite as robust as St. Joseph's is, um, certainly with the penetrating trauma. But it's not just penetrating trauma, right? There's a lot of things that can roll in there. So. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that they do have over here to try is they have a lot more um, trauma nurses with more experience. So I think they would be excited about it and probably open to trying it. Uh, and certainly working on the night shift, that's when a lot of this exciting stuff tends to happen too. So. Yeah, no, you're absolutely, you're spot on board with that. And look, I mean, I think the repercussions across the board are there for really anybody. Anytime we have one of our staff leaving kind of that safe confines of an emergency department to go out there, we don't know what they're going out there for. So again, at the very least, there's a safety in number and make sure that we're not sending someone out into the void by themselves, that there's always a pairing that's going on or something like that. Even if you're not going to protocolize it to the extent that they did here, or that we might need to do with someplace like Patterson, at least maybe put something in place where you've got a little bit more... Uh, with an eye on safety, particularly safety of your staff and ultimately safety of that patient as you're taking him out of the car. We did have one, somebody came in with, um, it was like a motor vehicle crash or something, but when they opened his bag to find his wallet to register him, they did find a whole bunch of loaded weapons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you just never know. I mean, I've had little old ladies brought in. I had one little old lady, she must have been in her mid eighties once and she was going through her purse and she pulled out her denture thing and she pulled out her checkbook and she pulled out her 32 caliber <laughs> one that cracked open and of course everybody in the room is like uh let's get security in here but you know she's like very matter of fact like yeah you just never know yeah any other thoughts or comments from anyone yeah steve i i again i i think that's a great article and um I, I can't think of a place that I've worked where there haven't been weapons brought into the emergency department. Um, you know, the, the few times I've seen where it could have been bad, fortunately, you know, police were on scene, but that's not always the case. Um, we don't, I haven't seen police transport uh, in New Jersey. I'm, I'm sure it does happen, uh, probably, Camden for certain, uh, since it's right across the river from Philly. But have have you guys have a lot of any police transports or? We don't. It's one of the things that we have we have initially started to breach the topic a little bit with our police department here in uh, Patterson. They're not against it. Their biggest concern were always the liabilities. What happens if the patient dies en route to the hospital? Do we have a liability that's there? The mounting literature, I think, is growing to certainly probably dismay some of that, but I still think that that's the hesitancy that's out there. Um, I was hoping that Katie Morella was going to join us tonight. She had registered up, but she didn't look like she called in. But my understanding is they have been doing some transport um, at university in Newark. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's protocolized, but I do know that it's not uncommon for police to bring uh, patients in via police car there. So um, I was hoping to try to get kind of her eye view on 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 whether or not they have a, a procedure in place there. Because once again, much much like us, much like Cooper, or much like uh, University of Newark, you know, a very similar environment with our urbanized and a lot of penetrating trauma. Just kind of hearing kind of how how they do things there or don't do things there. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I'm, I'd kind of be interested to see if anybody else uh, thoughts on, you know, our EMS system in, in New Jersey is a two tiered system in the sense that we have BLS usually do the transport and ALS responds. And, you know, inherently that has a lot of benefits, particularly for, I'd say, non trauma patients, you know, your cardiacs and strokes and things like that. Um, but when there's delays waiting for one or the other service, uh, you know, that's not always in the best interest of patients. And um, so I'd be curious what other folks think about that kind of uh, process and what, what opportunities there might be because of that. 
Yeah, yeah, I've seen it more and more. And, and I have heard much like you said, I think Camden has certainly experimented or they've at least talked about it. We've talked about it with Patterson. Again, I've heard through the grapevine that that Newark has done it. I don't think it's by protocol. Um, so yeah, who knows? I mean, you know, if, if it even starts to dialogue, again, at the end of the day, it's what's best for that patient. Mm -hmm. um, what we've seen time and time again from mass shootings and particularly from active shooter situations is police transport is actually not even really a, a fourth, a, a, an unknown thought now. I mean, you, know, you look yeah. at what happened in, in, in Las Vegas where, you know, a, a large number um, of individuals were taken by police car, a lot of times stolen police car uh, to the yeah. hospitals there. In Aurora, Colorado, when they had the uh, the Batman shooting, um, they basically could, again, because of some issues with getting EMS on scene in a timely fashion, they were putting people in patrol cars and, and taking them. So I think the more you see that and the more reticent uh, law enforcement is for that, I think it's there. We're also training up law enforcement a lot now in the pre-hospital environment to be more tactically oriented. We're giving tourniquets and pressured dressings and and uh, quick clot um, and chest seals uh, to them. So I think where they're a little bit more comfortable at maybe being able to put their hands on, maybe that'll also be a gateway to maybe even doing some level of transport. I don't know. I have to say what I've seen um, most of the time with police transporting, I've seen it in the pediatric population, particularly in drownings, uh, where they scoop up the kid, throw them in the car and run. Yeah. And I've seen that with uh, kids actively seizing too, you know, in that kind of a medical situation, they were not as hesitant to do it versus, you know, a, a penetrating or something like that. Yeah. And, 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 and I, and I think a lot of that is because they think, you know, again, dire straits, seizing kid, not breathing kid, let's get them in the car and go. And maybe it's a matter of, again, educating law enforcement to understand that gunshot wound bleeding you know what there's nothing we can do for them outside the hospital so anything we can do to get them to a hospital quicker is is something we need to look at but i, I think ultimately and i hate to say it because it'll never happen if we try to go this route in the state of new jersey is what probably have to be something that would have to be issued from the state level the state ag would actually have to step up and then probably you know give dominus ominous to the fact law enforcement yes you can transport you should transport whenever feasible blah 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 um so i'm not sure it's always going to be incumbent on municipal law enforcement to make this happen unless it's a progressive department without either a county uh prosecutor or more ardently the state ag st stepping up on board and being an advocate and, and that may end up being a place that eventually we do have a sit down with with, with the AG and say, hey, look, this is kind of the growing literature that's out there. What are your thoughts on this? And, you know, if you get an AG that poo-poos it from the start, well, it's probably never going to happen, but, you know, you just never know. It's almost interesting that there's not already and like an all or nothing protocol. Like if they're willing to transport anyone, then you'd think that this would fall under it. Like we used to get a lot of police transport for psych patients, you know, handcuffed in the back of the car. Not all of which ended up being psych, you know what I mean? Some of them did, some of them ended up other organic stuff. So it's like, you know, leaving it at the discretion of the officer with whatever training, it almost, you know, like you said, if there's concern about liability, you'd think that it would be like all or nothing. Like, don't bring anyone then. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think again that's 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 a, that's a gap in knowledge, and it's a gap in understanding that yes, you can put your hands on somebody, you can help them out, and more importantly, yeah, you can put them in the back of your car and get them to a hospital, particularly if the ambulance is there, or you may know for you through the dispatch center that there's a delay in getting an ambulance on scene, or there's not an ambulance available. We're having to go mutual aid three towns over, like does happen throughout the state. So, um, yeah, I, again, I think it's an educational type of thing that'll have to occur, you know, segmentally throughout, you know the variety of different, you know, agencies that we deal with. But look, I mean, I think this is out there now and it, it's something we're chatting about. And it's only a matter of bending the ear of somebody that you may know who's on the police department, uh, be it a sergeant, a captain or something like that to kind of, you know, see, hey, is this something, what do you guys think of that? So, and certainly that's what we've done. We're kind of breaking, breaking the water a little bit with the Patterson police. They're, they're not ardently against it. Uh, Jerry Speciali, who is the police director or public safety director for Patterson, very progressive in his approach to doing some things. So I think if we have a chance of getting it done, Patterson might end up being uh, one of those model towns um, you know, that, that we might be able to get it started on. But, um, you know, I, I, again, I found it very interesting that, you know, again, that what they were doing not only at Penn Medicine because of the police um, transport of these patients, but also just, you know, they've been doing this for decades and it was only within the last year and a half that they actually put themselves a protocol in place. And the light bulb went off 
in my mind, and I know Billy, when I shared the article with you, I saw the light bulb go off on you as well. It's like, well, this makes perfect sense. Why haven't we thought about doing this some kind of a protocol before? Because inherently it's something that maybe we do need to think about. But again, as you said, depends on the environment you work in, how often this truly does happen. You know, certainly in Patterson, we got the data to show 54% of our gunshot wound victims are penetrating trauma, gunshot and stabbing victims are coming by the front door. So our environment is perfect to do it. Um, and, you know, again, depending on what your environment is, it may or may not rise to the occasion. Well, it's not just trauma either. Like the, the backboard transport out of the car onto the ground is like people show up in their cars for all kinds of things laying down in the backseat of a car. It doesn't just have to be trauma. Absolutely. You're you absolutely know? correct. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I don't recall reading anything in the article about, um, cleaning or decontaminating the police car afterwards uh, it, it, my th only thought is they must be concerned about man I'm gonna have to clean my car up after this you know uh, any thought of lending expertise or help on the hospital part for cleaning agents or something I don't know yeah, I would almost, and you know, it wasn't in the article, uh, and were, they, they, they didn't show any pictures in the article of how they had PPE and stuff like that set up. But yeah, you certainly would think the very, the very least the give back would be, you're going to have some kind of disinfectant, some kind of stuff to help them decontaminate the back of their car. And, and, and maybe that's the, uh, maybe that's kind of one of the, uh, the, the negotiating points you make with them is that we'll help you clean out the back of your car after you, you transport these patients. I don't know, but that's a good point. And it should be done the right way. I mean, I'm not going to rely on a cop to know how to do a decon of a bunch of blood on the back of his car. I mean, you know, they 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 construct the back seats of these cars and the back seats of these SUVs that they are vinyl, they are hard plastic, they are very cleanable because they do transport people who have various sundry body fluids on them all the time. Um, but uh, you know, the reliance in them being able to properly clean a, a bloody mess up, it's it certainly I don't think within their bandwidth. Any other thoughts? Coming up on about the hour mark here. I have a thought, Steve. Talk away, I, I hate to bring this up like this, but my, um, my heart is always for the patient first and the patient outcomes. But um, a lot of times with the circumstances that we've currently been under the past two years and currently not only with law enforcement, but with the emergency department, there's a lot of understaffing and things like that. So um, a lot of times, especially in geographical areas where we have like at Patterson, a high percentage that is dropped off, like the article had said, there are, or there's a high potential that there is going to be no pre-notification. And as much as it pains me to, to bring in the money factor of this, you know, the bottom line for a hospital is the bottom line. And if there's not, you know, money being brought in for trauma, then, you know, we can't pay the people who are working the traumas. Um, so for, you know, that's kind of another aspect if, if there's more thought or anything that could be put into allowing, you know, the um, trauma association has, you know, specific rules and regulations for trauma billing. So to at least have that pre-notification in there and where it can be documented for like the registry aspect in order to, you know, correlate with that, it would, it would definitely help the workers that are performing these services for the public. Yeah, I agree. I think you bring up a good point. And I think the article actually says, as a general rule, law enforcement will get on the radio to their dispatch center, and then the dispatch center will give some level of pre- pre-notification to the trauma center. They're not going to give them any kind of a history or anything like that other than cop coming your way with gunshot wound victim. But I mean, that does, would get some ires up that you should be listening up for that patrol car pulling up. And, and if it's done the right way, and again, I'm I, I'd really like to talk to to to, to the guys at Penn. Uh, I reached out to him with a couple of emails and, and didn't get a response, but I'm going to keep trying to just try to get a little bit more information. And, and Shiloh, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask them in particular is, you know, how often are you getting pre-arrival notifications from law enforcement when they're doing it? It should be fairly simple to do. And then the other question becomes, and again, that's more your billing end, is, um, is a police 
pre-arrival notification, is that pre-arrival notification good enough from a billing standpoint to bill as a pre, you know, uh, a pre-notified trauma arrival? So I, I don't know. I don't know if you know a little bit of information on that. If it has to come from a EMS agency or can it be from anybody? Yeah, Steve, I, that's a very good question. And um, police and fire both would qualify as pre-notification. Mm -hmm. um, now, even though like if a family brings a, a patient in, you can't pre-bill because they can't pre-notify. However, there are strategies that you can use to do a, a legitimate bill that would cover the cost. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get reimbursed, right. but then it becomes uncompensated care. And that's wrapped into the formulas that CMS uses to set their fees. So at some point there, there's an advantage to, to looking at that. And um, I'd refer folks to the Trauma Center Association of America. They have probably the most robust and they were the ones who uh, went to CMS and had the trauma activation fees initiated years ago. Yeah, spot on. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, exactly. So, so, and again, it's it's something that's there. But you know, I and I found that they, they particularly had made mention of that in the article that you know they do try to get some pre pre notification through police dispatch. Um, how often that happens or not, I don't know. But yeah, cops like to talk on the radio, so my guess is it probably happens more times than it doesn't. But uh, interesting, interesting. I did put a link in the uh, chat box um, that has a uh, link that if you want to go and claim CE credit for tonight, you can do that. And then also this QR code, if you just want to train your phone on that and zap that, that'll get you over to the survey monkey. So you can complete the uh, post uh, post evaluation and then give me your demographic information and I'll get you a CE certificate post haste. Um, in addition to that, again, a little advertisement here for um, the topics in trauma and nursing coming up December 21st. Um, again, Jessica Mills out of Newberry County Memorial Hospital has been kind enough to come up and uh, reprise her talk on the trauma diamond of death and the utilization of calcium, particularly in our patients that are coming in uh, that are now getting uh, whole blood uh, component blood therapy, both in the uh, trauma resuscitation area, as well as some cases in the uh, pre-hospital setting, um, be having an eye on making sure that uh, we keep an eye on the calcium levels and give supplemental calcium uh, to thwart off hypocalcemia, which is emerging to be a, a large uh, morbidity stake uh, in, in these trauma patients. So um, hopefully you guys will be able to, to join us on December 21st. Um, if you can't, I'm going to record that as well. We'll put it up on YouTube and you'll be able to at least watch that after the fact as well. So um, anybody else have any questions or comments? All right. Well, cool beans. Well, there's my contact information. If you have any questions or comments, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. What I'll probably be doing over the course of the next week or so is I'll get out, uh, get out, I'll email you um, your CE certificates. I have uh, all your information from registration. Um, on the evaluation form, you have the ability to make a note on there that you want to be notified uh, for future topics in trauma, as well as trauma nursing journal club. I'll pop you into my little database and send you out emails and flyers on a on a, on a not too encumbering basis. And again, do me a favor if you wouldn't mind, uh, you know, pass these out to any folks you know uh, that you think might uh, be interested in, in joining us for future iterations. So if nobody else has anything else, I absolutely appreciate everybody's time tonight. Uh, hope you all have a good time, good holiday season. If I don't see you between now and then, and again, thanks for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.